Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are just going to get started. I know we have a few other people joining in. Um, but before we get into our, our remarks, I wanted to welcome everyone uh, for joining us on this webinar, which I think is such an important conversation to have. Um, not only for yourself, but also for your loved ones and your family. And absolutely thrilled to have uh, Jim Sweetlove and Dr. Frank uh, Fernazio with us to participate in this conversation. So I just wanted to let you know that during um, the first half an hour or so, Frank, Jim and I are going to have a conversation and talk about a number of issues and I'll be asking some questions. If you have any questions that you would like posed, there are a number of ways you can do that and we'll have time to answer those questions at the end. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you click on that Q&A button, you can post your question and I will see that and I will moderate that portion. You can also send me a chat, I'm the host, or you can send the panelists a chat message um, with your question and I will then repeat it so for the benefit of all the other attendees to be able to hear. Okay, so um, why don't we get started? Maybe I can ask Jim and Frank just to give a little introduction of yourselves and then we'll get into our questions. Jim, you wanna go first? Hey. Sure, thanks, Anessa, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this program. Uh, these are always enjoyable. Um, I just uh, want to uh, make a couple of remarks. First of all, I, I am a retired lawyer. I uh, have been for a few years now, and uh, I practiced for something over 40 years, primarily in the areas of uh, estate planning, estate administration, and estate litigation. Um, but my remarks today are observations only. They're not to be construed as professional advice. I'm well past providing that. Um, it's basically based on my observations uh, during my years of practice, and I was certified by the Law Society as a specialist in estates and trusts. Um, so I met with a lot of clients over the years, uh, garnered a lot of observations, and I also work with a number of charitable organizations, including uh, I was honored to serve uh, on the board of the Joseph Brand Hospital Foundation for six years, last two years as, uh, as chair. So thank you again for inviting me. Well, thanks for joining us. Frank? Hey, thanks, Anissa. And thanks again, everyone, for, for coming. I think this is a very uh, interesting event. I'm very Pleased to be beside such a wise man as a Jim Sweetlove, who has some very sage advice for everyone. Uh, I'm the lead hospitalist at Joseph Brand Hospital, and so my day-to-day -day work is really caring for predominantly elderly patients. So I get to see some of the more difficult things that happen as you get older, and I see some of the difficult decisions that people have to make. Um, and I'm certainly wanting to help and educate you on how to deal with uh, with those issues. So, so glad to be here, thanks. Great, thank you, Frank. So Jim, I thought we would maybe start with you. And I think, you know, estate planning is really important for everyone, those who have already done it and those who have not. I think, you know, some, it's a little bit more obvious why those who have not done their estate planning, why they should. So maybe you can touch a little bit on that, but also those who have, is it, all, is it good to review it, to update it? What, what advice would you give? Very good question. And you know, we've probably all seen the statistics that show the percentage of people who haven't done any estate planning. And it's quite staggering. Uh, it's well over half the people in our population. And we're an aging population. People need to think about this. If you don't have a will or an up-to-date uh, estate plan, you're probably foregoing some advantages that you could have uh, set up in your estate plan, both tax-wise and in terms of leaving legacies for charities, grandchildren, and so on. If you've got no will, um, basically there's something that called an intestacy that results, and the legislation in the province is going to say where your estate goes. And it's probably not the way, if you were to think about it, and answer questions about it, you'd have it work. So um, that's a basic reason, the basic reason why you need a will as part of your estate plan. And 
I often get the question, or I used to get the question, how often should I review my estate plan? And I think the right answer is, is based on how often you should review it. You don't always have to change it. You may look at it and it's perfectly fine. It still works the way you want, but it's important to look at it periodically because things change. Your family changes. There are more generations. People's marital status changes. The tax laws change. Uh, your assets change. The value of your assets change. You may have had a summer cottage. Now you don't have a summer cottage. You may never have had a summer cottage until the last few years, and now you've been fortunate enough to acquire one. All those things are the types of things that you need to think about just to make sure that if something were to happen to you tomorrow, things will unfold exactly the way you would want them if you were there telling people what you want to have happen. Yeah, I want to touch on a couple of things that you said. So um, about, you know, leaving a legacy and how perhaps, you know, giving thought to how you would like to be remembered or, or what you would like to leave um, when you depart, as well as the tax benefits. And I think, you know, often the two things can happen at the same time. And so uh, what are some of the different ways a gift can be left in a will and what should people really consider when they're making those decisions on that kind of uh, charitable sure. support? Again, good question. And, and I just reiterate what you said. Um, there are tax advantages. I often would tell people the tax advantages aren't what should drive your decision. But if there are tax benefits that you can get through making your decisions, you should by all means explore them. Uh, particularly if you've got publicly traded shares and so on. So there are some real advantages to making tax advantages to making charitable gifts. Um, and it can they can greatly reduce the tax consequences uh, that occur when a person passes away, particularly with respect to things like RRSP proceeds, RIF proceeds, and capital gains, all of which, fall into place when a person passes away. There are a myriad of ways that you can set up a charitable legacy. Um, this can include a simple monetary amount, X dollars to Y charity, uh, a share of the estate, you know, 10% to a particular charity, a specific object or an article, uh, publicly traded shares, um, pieces uh, or all of insurance policies or RRSPs, or things can be set up as a trust where uh, a portion of your estate is set aside and the money flows out over time to a charity or another beneficiary such as a grandchild. So there's lots of ways to do this that can work with your particular circumstances, your particular family and your particular assets. But the main thing is it has to conform with what you want to see achieved through that particular charity. Okay. And so, you know, obviously when estate planning comes up, most people think of taxes, inheritances, um, gifts to charitable um, organizations. But Frank, part of that estate planning also has to do about talking about the end of life and your wishes. Um, at your end of life with your loved ones, which isn't always an easy conversation for people to have. And so can you share with us from your perspective, why is it important to have these conversations with your loved ones? And is there any uh, easy way to start that conversation or anything that you can, um, any tips that you can give us on that piece? Even, and I think it's difficult both ways, the one wanting to, um, determine their end of life wishes or the younger, you know, child speaking to the well, parents about what they want as well. I think it's difficult both ways. Thanks, Vanessa. A great question. And Ken, you're asking me to talk about something that, that most people don't want to talk about. So this is, I always say like life is for the living, but unfortunately everyone dies. Like there's an end for everyone. And so what, we talk about or what I always talk about is is trying to make that as 
dignified, as respectful, and as comfortable a process as possible. Uh, the thing is, it can't happen unless you've laid out, the person has laid out what it is they want. And it really comes, as you said, it's a very, very good point. It, it works on both sides. There are people that just don't want to talk about the end. Look, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know anything about it. When it comes, it comes. But I've seen death many times, unfortunately. And it can be a very comforting, uh, almost soothing and, and a relief-like process, or it can be almost a terror, like with a lot of angst and, and gnashing of teeth. And we, we want to reduce that. And part of it is, a lot of it is because the family doesn't know what the person would like. Because as a power of attorney, everyone says, okay, you, know, you always have a power of attorney when you're not able to speak for yourself. And so there's a, a clarity that needs to be made around power of attorney. The power of attorney doesn't give their opinion. That's not what their role is. Their role is to speak for the person who happens to be ill. So they're transmitting not their own wishes, but the wishes of the person who is sick. And that's pretty critical. But the problem is you can't transmit those wishes unless you know what they are. And so as, a, as an aging adult, again, not, you know, you don't really want to talk about, you know, the end of life, but it's pretty important to ask yourself, um, how would you like that to look? How aggressive would you like people to be? How peaceful would you like to be? There's some people that say, you know, I want to fight right to the end. That's fine. Let your family know that. And, and that's, that's an approach that can be taken. There's always a price for everything. Other people say, you know what, if it becomes obvious that I'm not going to progress or I'm going to have a life that is not consistent with what I like or enjoy, then I want you to keep me comfortable. Things like that, number one, allow the care team to do a great job. But number two, they put the family at peace because you never want to be the person that says, oh, you know what? Let my dad go. Let my mom go. You feel like it's a, you know, oh, I didn't, I didn't fight for them. I didn't, I didn't work hard enough for them. When that wish is clearly transmitted, it brings, brings peace to everyone. And honestly, it can be like a very, strangely, it can be a very beautiful process. So how to talk about it when people don't want to talk about it. I, I think that you always want to couch it. So as the person, let's say that I'm the, the, the older person, I want to talk to my family and they don't want to listen. You, you know, it's important to say, look at, you know what? I know this is uncomfortable. I know this is fun. And I know you want me to be around forever, hopefully. Uh, but you want to know my wishes so that you can do the right thing and you can have the pressure taken off you. Just tell them, listen, this is what, this is what dad wanted. This is how his care is. And if you're the child, again, couch it in the same way. Like, Look at, you know, mom, dad, when you're reaching the end of your life, I want to know what is you want. I don't want you to be saying to me, you know, what the hell did you do? Why did you let me come back? Look at me. I can I can't I can't move I can't this is not life what did you do so it becomes very important to just gently keep trying to broach it and again say just out of just out of protection for them and for yourself to say look at this is what we need yeah I don't know if that's helpful no I think it is and I think your piece about it bringing comfort um you know just personally and I think I shared this with you before uh, my mother who's in her early 80s, uh, you know, is very excited that she made her plans. I've written everything down. It's in a folder. And I said, well, okay, that's great. And it was a difficult conversation for me because I didn't want to talk about losing my mother. Um, but my sister and I sat down and said, well, you know, it might be worth us looking at it together to make sure we could clarify it. And um, the opening line when I opened up her book was like, if you're reading this, this means I must be dead. She's like laughing. She's like, I've always wanted to write that. I've always wanted to say that. And in a way that really broke the ice for all of us to have a really honest conversation. And I like, you know, she had detail down to pallbearers and the, the mass and, and, you know, I was like, oh, you really want that person? Yes, I do. And it, so it was, it's important to know that when the time comes, my sister and I don't have to make those decisions. It's all laid out, and particularly when it comes to healthcare. And I know a colleague of ours shared that there was a, her mother had um, signed her 
DNR. And um, that actually meant no antibiotics, no intervention at all, which I don't think people really understand what that means in the end. So I think it's important to not only have the conversation with your loved ones about end of life wishes, but also get clarity and understanding of what those terms mean. Because certainly I didn't understand that's what that meant. Um, so I think that's really important. Uh, for those who have just joined us, I know uh, some joined us a little bit late. We, this whole webinar is going to be recorded, and so we'll be able to send it out to you so you can uh, catch anything that you missed at the end. Uh, just please let either Emma in her office or call the foundation. We'll be able to get that to you. And this, and this if I could just yeah. offer Go one ahead. comment on what, yeah. what Frank so aptly laid out. One thing that I often in, encountered with, with clients was whether it was in the context of doing their will or deciding where articles were going to go or their health care, two, actually two things that they often said to me. One was, my, my family will know what I want. And often they don't know what you want. No, no. And I see Frank shaking his head. They, they, you assume that they know what you want because of little things you've said along the way, but you've got to lay it out for them. The second thing that they always that they always said to me was or often said to me, my children get along perfectly. They'll yeah. agree on whatever. And that isn't the case either in most instances. So the clearer you lay it out to everybody, the better it's going to work for everybody. Yeah, very good point. Um, so. This brings me to our next question. So if loved ones who are very private and have not disclosed their estate plans or end of life wishes to their next kin, um, can you share maybe like a few must-haves, things that if they don't want to have a full discussion, they're not comfortable with it. There are the three most important questions to ask or five most important conversations to have. What would they be? both from, I think, a financial planning as well as medical planning. Maybe we'll start with you, Frank, and then we'll go over to Jim. Sure, it, it gives us what I've talked a bit about, but I think the most important thing would be the discussion around your disability, because it's hard, you know, everyone is very different. I look at someone like Stephen Hawking and the life that he lived, uh, very, very difficult. Even Christopher Reeve, you know, essentially mm -hmm. paralyzed, and they lived, incredibly fulfilling lives, but they chose that and they knew they wanted that. And so they followed that. There are many people, many, many people that I've met who look at that and just say, you know what, I, I could do that. That's, that is not for me. So part of it is, is asking about, you know, what degree of disability is, is okay. And that's kind of a, a tough one to ask, but again, as people age, that quality of life, the ability to get around, the ability to be independent, uh, is is an important one and again everyone looks at it uh looks at it differently mm -hmm. um i think that honestly is probably the number one thing to discuss because that's really kind of where we where we get uh, where we get stuck i mean because a lot of people will say for example you know do you want to go to a nursing home or not a nursing home has changed a lot over the last 25 years okay the quality of care that's offered in a nursing home is much better uh, but a lot of people who are older really have a very negative view of the nursing home. Really, you know, there's an old book that they wrote, you know, called the you know, Warehouses of Death. They used to be quite, quite dark places and, and the care was, was substandard. But regardless, some people just say, look, that's not really for me. I do not want to be in a nursing home. If I'm so infirm that I will end up in a nursing home, that's not something that I want. So choose these these wishes for me so those are a couple just important things because those are the most difficult decisions a lot of times that we face is that we do help someone we get them through and then they go to a nursing home mm -hmm. and the, the angst on honestly and for some people a tremendous amount of pain so it's very important to make sure that that you discuss kind of what which direction we'd like to go with that okay thanks jim just a couple of things to add to what Frank said, and I, I think he's he's spot on in terms of those decisions about what level of care a person wants and where they want to receive it. Um, you know, and they need to they need to address that if they're going to go back to their home. Uh, 
do they have the ability to live somewhat independently and what level of care can they get and what's it going to cost? Because as crass as it might sound to people, that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes the family will say, I don't care if you spend every dime. Uh, we just want to do what's best for you. And you tell us what you think is best for you. And I've had clients specify that in instructions they've left with me, the level of care that they want, the type of long-term care they want, uh, whether or not they want to have uh, attendant care where, where, they, where they go to. Um, and as Frank says, people's uh, perception right now might be somewhat different as they start to experience uh, having to make those decisions. They might actually move to a retirement home where they say, gee, I never thought it was going to be like this. If I had known it was going to be like this, I'd have moved here five years ago. Um, and people might say, I want to go to a facility, for example, where I'm going to go in at a certain level. And if my health declines, I can get more care without moving again. Because I think Frank would would agree with me that the more times a person moves, the more adverse effects on their health are likely to occur. So people might, you know, like to think about making those kinds of decisions so that uh, their family knows how they want to do it. And one thing I think that we can't, that we shouldn't pass by, that as long as the person is capable of making those decisions, they can keep making those decisions. The family can't suddenly say, we don't like the kinds of decisions you're making. If the person's capable of making those decisions, although everybody else in the world might think they were foolish, mm -hmm. they can keep making those decisions. So I guess that brings me to my next question. What if they're, so they come to the hospital and they are incapable to make the decisions, but they also do not have a power of attorney for personal care. So what, how, how are decisions made then if they're not able to speak for themselves and they have no one assigned to speak for themselves? That well, that can be, yeah. yeah, sorry, that can become a, a very difficult. And it's, uh, obviously there's, a, there's a, a pecking order that's established. So it would be, you know, a wife or spouse, um, you know, children and the relatives kind of working all the way down. So if, if there is someone uh, who's related to the person, they would then become the substitute decision maker if they wished to become the substitute decision maker. And some people, it's not common, but some people will reject that work. And so we're left with the public guardian, which is really, you don't really want to go there. Um, it's essentially a stranger who's kind of guessing, you know, this seems reasonable, this seems unreasonable. Uh, unreasonable. Um, so it does become very important. It, it's important to assign it, not because legally, like your spouse already would become the substitute decision maker. It's not like we would go to the public guardian uh, at all. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but obviously the, the discussion is important just so that we know, uh, number one, who to approach. That's always easier, especially if it's siblings, because then they all have kind of equal, like equal standing. It's not done by age or anything like that. And especially if there's disagreement amongst the siblings about what to do, it can become, uh, it can become very chaotic and difficult to, to manage patient's care uh, with, uh, with clear direction. I want to go back just for a second to what Jim said, because it was very, really good what you talked about. It's a little bit out of the scope of what we're talking about today, but about the you know, retirement homes and kind of finding places that are appropriate to, to care for you at the stage you're at in your life. And you also mentioned an important thing that does cost money, like the good ones are, are not cheap, but they do provide a, a pretty incredible level of care that will allow you to remain independent for, for longer if that's an option that someone wants to pursue. And again, everyone is different in the way they look at how do they want to spend their money, how independent do they do they want to be and how much they want to stay in the old family home? Because that is an enormous draw. I can't even tell you how many people, including my own mother, just to say, you know what? No, I don't want to leave here. This is my home. I want to leave here. And it's becoming very, it becomes very, very difficult. And you do sometimes have to get private help in. Um, but those are those are some of the things to discuss. And and, and I think Jim's point is excellent, is that the 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 person who's at the center of this, I'm not gonna call them a patient, but the person who's at the center of this 
really does drive the decisions. They're, they are the boss. And this is one of the things that I always talk about is really trying, as that's part of the dignity of, of aging or getting towards the end is allowing some kind of control to allow people to make decisions and then us respecting the decisions afterwards. Okay. Okay, Jim, you're good? Okay, perfect. So um, maybe we'll end, Jim. I'm gonna end with a question on you before we get into the questions from the group. Um, but can you, other than, you know, some of the tax benefits, um, can you give some reasons why a person should really consider a charitable legacy gift and, and how do they confirm those gifts? I, you know, I think for some people, the thought of it is nice, but they just don't understand how they can and why they should. Um, so if you can have any advice on that. Sure. A few points. Um, first of all, uh, to go back to why you should leave such a legacy and beyond the tax benefits. Um, let's consider that this is called a legacy. It's, it's you speaking to your family, to the community, to the charity, saying, I want to leave a legacy and this is what it looks like. And so people should, I think, uh, select charity or charities based on what that charity means to them. What is the mission of that charity? What impact does it have in the in the community and how does that align with your values because it's all about values and and if you've got an opportunity while you're doing this planning to establish a relationship with that charity and Anissa knows all about establishing those with people in the community you're going to feel much more comfortable about creating a legacy through that charity um, and they're going to feel much more comfortable about respecting your wishes when it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important that if, as you think about these things to consider a step making a relationship with the, with the uh, charity. It's not like they're going to be expecting a check tomorrow. They want to develop that relationship with you um, because good charities and the, most of the ones that I've encountered or I would classify as good charities, they're donor driven. They're not necessarily dollar driven, they're donor driven. They wanna do what's best for you so that you can achieve your wishes. And they may be able to point out things to you that you're not even aware of, uh, ways in which you can make an impact through a gift. Then when you've decided that you wanna think along those lines, it's important for you to talk to a wide range of people, your financial planner to see what could be set up and what the tax advantages might be, your accountant of such, definitely your lawyer so it can be properly crafted to do exactly what you want. And last but certainly not least, your family, because you, you probably want to let them know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because if you let them know why you're doing it, how this reflects your values and what you want to see achieved, they're going to be much more comfortable with it. And one of the things that is a side benefit to legacies like this, um, that sometimes people think about and sometimes they don't want to have anything to do with because they're not interested in recognition, is that if you do something for the benefit of a charity in your community, that tends to have a positive effect on other people who might be thinking mm -hmm. about similar uh, values and benefiting uh, the community or a charity in a particular way. If they say, oh, so-and-so did that, and I see that, you know, maybe they were a person of modest means just like me, and they were able to do that, I should be able to do something like that too. Yeah, and I do, you know, the part about the relationship, Jim, and, um, you know, being that sort of public about that support, Often a lot of organizations will allow you to be recognized for your gift prior to the maturity of the gift, so prior to receiving it. So you can um, you know, be recognized while you're with us for what you will be contributing to and what you've contributed to. And I think that's really important too from a family celebration and loved one celebration perspective. Yeah. So absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so I'm happy to open up um, 
the floor to questions from our attendees. Um, there was one before we, um, I don't see any yet. Again, you can click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen or in the chat to send your message to us. And I will um, ask our panel. But Frank, we've talked a lot about, you know, end of life. How do we stay healthy and live longer? So as we get older, um, what would you recommend is one thing that we can do to benefit our future health? What would that be? Well, that's a loaded, uh, loaded question. A lot of things, uh, but obviously, if there was a medicine that I could prescribe to everyone that would change their lives, help their lives, and make them healthier, uh, reduce the risk of cancer, dementia, uh, heart attack, stroke, through the exercise. I know it's boring and I know it's hard, but study after study after study shows that maintaining muscle mass, so that means you know resistance training, you know lifting weights, and it doesn't have to be in a gym, it doesn't have to be massive amounts of weight, but just working on your strength. And then in terms of preventing falls, working on flexibility. I mean, I just can't say how critical that is in terms of preventing disease. Uh, just reading today as I was preparing for, for this, again, a number of studies done in the States and the benefits are almost ridiculous. If this was a drug, it'd be the number one drug in the world, like easily, because everyone would take it. But it is you know, there's some sweat involved with it and it's hard to motivate, but that would be what I would recommend, a regular exercise on a daily basis, 15 to 20 minutes, doesn't have to be the gym, just brisk walking, you can be walking around the a room. It doesn't have to be formal, but it does have to be exercise and there should be some resistance or some kind of weight aspect to it. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Um, the one thing too, since we're here and it's um, a hospital driven event, do you want to tell us a little bit about geriatric care and the program here at the hospital and what the community can expect in terms of support that way? Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for bringing that up because, you know, I'm very passionate about, about geriatric care I and mean, care of the elderly. And this is, this is a population that in Halton, is going to be grow substantially over the next 10 years. I mean, this is just mm -hmm. the beginning of the baby boom, beginning to age. And so I'm speaking on behalf of the leadership team and not necessarily that they agree 100% with what I'm saying, but I know I am pushing hard for us to become a geriatric center of excellence. I think that uh, already we have some programs, one called the Acute uh, Integrated Care of the Elderly Unit, we call it ACE for short. Now it's been put on pause because of the pandemic. Uh, but it really kind of focused on taking patients who are living independently to become ill and they have a decline to, to work really hard with them to keep them mobilizing, keep them moving well, keep them thinking and to get them in and out of hospital as quickly as possible. Not as a thing because we don't like them, but because we understand that every day that you lay still in the hospital takes three days to recover. So just think about that. If you wow. lay down for a week, this is the old days, you, know, you just oh, just lay down for a week. Yeah. Three weeks to get back to where you were. So we want to stop that. We do things like innovative things like getting people into uh, their own clothes as soon as they're as soon as they're able, obviously. If they're critically ill, that's a different story. But once they're they're more uh, able to mobilize, all of a sudden you're back in your normal clothes, you begin to feel like yourself. Yeah. So a lot of things, we look at drugs, interactions, and it's a whole team, a multidisciplinary approach that I think is critical. And so that's the inpatient part. We're gonna do that with surgical patients as well, with elderly surgical patients to help. And then, then there's a whole outpatient uh, piece that I think we really need to get going and I think would be very helpful for the community. Okay, it's funny you say that about normal clothes. When I um, was pregnant, I was on bed rest in the hospital for about five weeks. And as soon as I got there, I, I asked my husband to bring my clothes because you just feel, you feel different. It's a different, more positive outlook um, that you're there for a short stay, not a long stay. But Yeah, you don't want to feel, we're trying to get people to feel no, unsick as absolutely. soon as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we do have a question from one of the attendees. Is there a tool or resource you suggest for a list of those difficult questions we need to have with an aging parent? 
I don't know of one, I'll tell you the truth. Um, there, Ontario does have a website where they talk about advanced directives because this is a kind of a big push provincially. And I, I honestly, I think it's, it's beyond the two. So advanced directives is kind of like the technical term where you, you lay out what your wishes are. Um, let me, you know what, I'll look at it myself later. And if you leave some contact info for Anissa, I'll make sure that I get back to you. But I think that that would be a very good resource. Um, my personal feeling is that this is something that really should be a provincial mandate, that they really start to say very clearly, look, everyone, just start thinking, because this is not limited to a few people. Remember, there's a whole generation that is moving through this phase, and it really will help. It'll help us in healthcare, but it will mainly help the patient and especially the family to, to navigate these kind of tricky waters. Great question. I do know, Jim, did you have anything to add? Or I, I do know that our friends at um, the Carpenter Hospice had recently put out a social media post that was really helpful. It had five wishes to consider at the end of life. So to our guest, you can certainly look at um, their social media. I think it may have been on Twitter. Um, and it was one, the person you want to make the care decisions for you when you can't. Two, the kind of medical treatment you want or don't want. And I think that goes into, you know, the idea of uh, DNRs and um, <clears throat> restraints. Do you want to be restrained or not? Like that kind of thing. Um, how comfortable that you want to be and how you want people to treat you and what you want loved ones to know. So those are very, I think, easy icebreaker questions to get into that conversation. So um, it was a great um, post from the Carpenter Hospice. Jim, did you wanna add something? Sorry. No, I, I think that those uh, questions from the Carpenter Hospice are, are open-ended enough that when you start to work your way through them, you can drill down into specifics. You know, if you say, I, I, I only want this level of care, well, what does that mean? Uh, does that mean A or B? Uh, mm -hmm. And you really need to explore those things with the people who are going to be making those decisions. If you can't, uh, you know, the, you may have a very bald answer to one of these. Um, and the other thing is to build on what, uh, reiterate what Frank said, there are advanced health care directives that you can find out there uh, on the internet, put out by various uh, health agencies and so on that will enable you to go through some of these questions. I've seen a number of them that clients brought into me that they filled out, um, that they were provided by a health agency somewhere. Uh, I would caution you to make sure that as much as possible, you use ones that are based in Ontario yeah. because the laws are different in different, different places. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's all. Oh, we have another question. There we go. Sorry. Um, oh, so this is from the attendee. My father is one of those folks who says, you guys will figure it out. I don't want the pressure. <laughs> so I think it is really important for them to have a family discussion and they really appreciate your, um, your comments, both um, Jim and Frank. So thank you very much. Okay. So I, I don't see any other questions from the group. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. I really thank Jim and Frank. You've given us so much food for thought um, and really has made it kind of um, less, for me anyway, I've, the emotion has taken out a bit of it. It's more about, you know, really honoring people's wishes. And I think that's what we need to focus on. And um, there would be significant comfort in making decisions for a loved one when I know what they want and that that pressure is completely off you then. So anyway, thank you to everyone for joining us again. We will have this, this has been recorded. So if you would like a copy of that, please contact the foundation and we'd be happy to send you a copy. So have a great day, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. And thanks again, Jim and Frank, really appreciate it.